Hi, this is Russ with Devoted Golfer TV. I have a fitting business in Dallas called Fit Discover, and Ridge is the Mizuno rep. Yes, sir. How much of the country now? It feels like the entire country, but it's North Texas and Oklahoma. So I cover North Texas, West Texas, the Panhandle of Texas, and then the entire state of Oklahoma. Yeah. So, and before that, you were in Atlanta. I was. You know? I was. I worked in customer service at Mizuno. Um, I was a club fitter in Atlanta. I um, was used to run a driving range out in Atlanta. So I've been in the industry, oh gosh, it's been almost 16 years now. Yeah, yeah. The golf business has gone through a number of changes in the last couple of years. I mean, there was a COVID spike and then we slowed down a little bit last half of last year. Where are you seeing it going in 2024? I'm learning to say that word, 2024. It's crazy that we're already in 2024. Um, the leap year which is crazy but you know it's the golf industry is going to continue to grow you know we might have seen fittings flatten out on our side mm -hmm. but when we looked at rounds rounds are still going up when i talked to instructors they're getting new new students still all the mm -hmm. time and they're sticking to it you know that's really where i look to see where the industry is going and where the game of golf is going is who's picking it up and are they mm -hmm. sticking around mm -hmm. and i think anybody will have a friend or a relative that's picked up the game of golf since the pandemic and they've stuck with it. I can't tell you how many of my friends now are trying to reach out to me to play golf now. Yeah, um, yeah. Where it used to be, I used to get made fun of playing golf when I was a kid, but nowadays it's the cool thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good thing. It is. You know, I mean, you think about golf, it's a sport that you can play for your entire life. Absolutely. Right? I mean, if you're playing a team sport, you know, how do you put together a baseball team or a football team? Yeah to continue your recreational involvement with a sport later in your life. Where golf, all you need to do, I mean, you don't even have to have three buddies. You, yeah. you just walk to a course and go out and play. And if they think about golf, I, I love about this game is it's more of a, a mental test than it is a physical test. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of why you can play your whole life is it's not much about what you can do from a physical standpoint, it's how much you can handle from a mental standpoint. And I think people are starting to see that in golf and that's starting to become more of a mainstream thing. And now we're starting to see people gravitating towards the game. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's always that, that self challenge of, you know, what part of my game can I improve? Yeah. Can I get better at this? Can I improve my putting? Can I improve my chipping? Can I get my driver longer? You know, I'm at a range every day, you know, and, and on the warm days, no, the place is full. Yeah. I mean, we have days where there's people waiting to get, waiting to get a spot. And, you know, we've got 65 grass tees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's a great thing to see, you know, we're seeing such a stable growth and I think that's the most important thing. And, you know, from, from a golf perspective, just having the facilities that we have in DFW that they're being used in the way that they're being used it's going to help us grow the game as well because now you can go hit golf balls on a range and that can be your way to grow the game. You can go to a, you know, a top golf, for example. Right. I was just thinking of top golf. How many of them are there in the I have no area? idea. It's, it's getting, they just keep growing. They keep growing and not only just top golf. I mean, you have the other spinoffs of that, you know, PJ Frisco is now moved to the DFW area and they built a 12 hole par three course. You have their massive putting green. So, they're doing a lot of great things to keep people around the course, whether it be playing or just having a good time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we desperately needed to keep this, mm -hmm. this momentum going. Yeah. And you, you graduate from, from the top golf driving range and says, Hey, I wonder what this is like to actually go out and play around. You know, I, I think people now are also realizing you don't have to be good at golf to enjoy it. I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not great at this game. Mm -hmm. I am the last I will master it, mm -hmm. but I love playing. I love being out there. I love the camaraderie and I love the challenge. I'm not playing against my buddies. Yeah. I'm playing the course. Yeah, you know, and, and you just mentioned again where we were a few seconds ago. You don't think you're gonna ever master it, but you know, you're always working at mastery of this game. Of course. Yeah. That's that's it's the pursuit of perfection. Perfection's unobtainable, but we're always striving for it. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So every other year, well, every year you replace half the product line. Correct. And so now is the time when the MP line gets replaced, Mizuno Pro. And so we're going to start with the Fly High because you've made some changes to the Fly High over the last two years. We have. So let's take a look at, at this. This is the Fly High. 
and this is the hybrid replacement. It's the long iron replacement. It, it sits in between these two. Things. I like to call it a direct long iron replacement. I don't like calling it a driving iron because I feel that driving iron really pigeonholes what this club can do. Mm -hmm. You know, we call it a fly high because it can get up there and it will go to the moon and spin. Yeah, there's no such thing as a two iron or a three iron that goes too high. And if there's anybody who says that they hit their three iron too high, I'd love to work with them and see what is too high. Mm -hmm. Because if we can get a three iron or a two iron to stop on the green, sign me up. Right. And that's what this club does here. Yeah. And so, you know, you mentioned earlier, spin. Spin. How do you stop on the green? You spin. Spin. How do you, how do you get how do you get the proper angle of attack? You, you gotta spin it up. So oh. when it runs out of spin, then drive ups. So what improvements have been made in the twenty twenty four model? You know, this was a model that was a big challenge for our R and D team. Mm -hmm. This is a club that's been put in major champions bags over the last couple of years without us even having to pay for them. They knew that this was a club that was going to fit right at the top of their bag, mm -hmm. especially on a windy day or a day where, where the course were maybe playing more narrow than they'd like. This was a club for them. So we knew we had a big challenge to bring a new product to, to the market that was going to replace that. So, so the question that's running through my mind is, when would you go for the fly high as opposed to the hybrid? It just depends on the golfer. It just depends on what your game is and what you're looking for. Um, for me personally, I like a more compact look at a dress and giving me something that, that looks like an iron. Mm -hmm. So for me, I really like the way that this looks, but it also performs like a hybrid where it's going to get up in the air and it's going to spin more. So it's going to really come down to what you're looking for in the bag. And when you look at the entire Mizuno Pro line, you're going to realize that we're going to fit this to you not only from a performance standpoint, but also from an aesthetic standpoint as well. Would you look at turf conditions? So do you need a fly high and a hybrid in your bag based upon turf conditions that you're playing on? You know, it, it just depends on the golfer. That's the beauty of custom fitting. Yeah. There's no set thing for one golfer. I can't say, oh, this is a blanket statement for everybody. And that's why we do what we do and do club fitting. It's because everybody's different. Everyone needs, has a di different need at the top of their bag, the bottom of their bag, what iron gapping they need. That's why I tell everyone, go see a fitter to make sure that you get the right club for you. Because at the end of the day, we got to make this game a little bit easier for each other. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think as a fitter, you know, where you fit this in. You know, I have a pilot that I work with that carries two sets of wedges with different kinds of bounces. Yep. If he's playing soft floor to sand, he wants a little, you know, he wants a little more bounce. Over here, I have to grind his soles to give him a narrower, you know, a narrower sole. Yeah. So he can get into the sand here. So, I, you know, so that thought's running through my mind. Where do I go with fly high versus hybrid? Yeah, you know, for me, um, from my fitting perspective, I, I look at how they put the club into the ground. Are they someone who likes to pick the ball? Are they someone who likes to drive down on the ball? Do they generate a lot of club speed? Because um, the, there's a lot of different variables that go into it. And so I tell everyone, hit everything. You're there to get fit. Hit everything. Mm -hmm. Whether it be a high root, whether it be a fly high, whether it be a three wood, seven wood. Let's figure out what's going to be the best. But come in with an open mind. Is it? Okay. So tell me a little bit about what went on this year. Yeah, you know, we went back to the drawing board with this club. We went and did a completely new material. We went to the 4335 Cromali. Mm -hmm. And for those Mizuno fans out there, they know that that's a material that we've been using in the hot metals for a very long time. So Cromali is a material that we're very, very familiar with. Mm -hmm. We went with a softer 4335 nickel Cromali around the body, mm -hmm. which gives us more malleability. So it's going to be able to adjust that lie angle on that direct long eye replacement. And, and then you've got the same thing on the face. We went to, it's the same material, but we did heat treat. The heat treat. Yeah. yeah. So having that heat treated material makes that material a bit more firm to where we get more ball speed off the club base. Just like a hot metal, we built this with a, with a driver mentality. And when you design a driver, you start from the face and work your way back. Mm -hmm. So we did the same thing with this fly high. We went back to the drawing board and said, let's build this from the, from the face back. That's where you're seeing that, that heat tree of 4335 nickel Kumali, like the hot metal, and then getting into the different materials so that we can add that malleability to it as well. Okay. Tungsten weight? Tungsten weight. Put that deep in the sole. The lower the tungsten weight is, the higher the ball flies, and that's where it gets the name fly high. Oh, okay. 
And so here we're talking about the difference between the model from two years ago Correct. and this year. Yeah, so on the bottom here, you can actually see what the material was. So it was a 4331 stainless steel on the body mm -hmm. and an MAS-1C miraging seal on the face. Um, so that, that was a little harder to bend. It was. Yeah. It was. You know, the, and, and MAS-1C, that miraging steel is a great material for us. We've been using it in our hybrids for years and years and years. But just like any manufacturer in any R&D team, we're trying to push the limits. What can we do with the materials that we already have a great background in? Mm -hmm. And as we've grown in our understanding of chromoly metal over the last decade, we've understood that we can make it even thinner. We can make it more elastic to get more ball speed mm -hmm. without losing integrity of the face. Don't count. Tell me about this piece of it, tungsten. Yeah. Just getting, just again, bringing more so weight. So this, this, this is this piece. So, so you've taken and added some weight lower on the, on the club to get more loft, more spin. Correct. We added two extra grams. And again, it's just creating more height and creating more spin. How do you do that? You got to add more weight to the sole of the club. You got to get that weight lower on the, on the club face to get that center of gravity lower. Mm -hmm. When you make contact under that center of gravity, it, it, generally tends to get that ball higher in the air. And again, there's no such thing as a two or three iron that goes too high. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, and so face technology, how has that changed? You know, one of the new things now, if you look in there, we have that core tech with, um, in there. The name of the game, we've all maxed out COR on the center of the face. Mm -hmm. You know, the USGA and RNA say we can only get to a certain point when it comes to our COR. Mm -hmm. But what can we do to make that COR around the face, the average COR higher? Mm -hmm. That's the new game. It's called core area. Mm -hmm. So the core tech is what we use to create higher core area, the overall club itself. Okay. Is there another slide here? That you yeah, because there's over here, you see L face and there's okay. a really good graphic. I okay. want to show you guys on this as well. Here we go. So we do have a new welding technique with this club. Mm -hmm. If you notice, we move that, that weld line wrapped it around the club to the top of the club face right there. What that does is it gives us the ability to have a thinner top line. Also having that L face geometry, it gives us more flexibility lower on the face. Mm -hmm. Having more flexibility lower on the face, more elasticity, more ball speed. So just creating more ball speed and creating more core area. Again, the average COR. So there was this term years ago, um, cut face. Yeah. Is that what I'm looking at? <sighs> I mean, I, that, you know, that's kind of what I'm it, It's close, at. you know, because a cup face, it would come all the way up and around on the back. So I think with this one being more of an L shape, because having us having the ability to bring that weld line lower to create that smaller top line mm -hmm. gives us a way to make that thinner look while using the cup face technology. And so the cup face technology increases that, that the sweet spot yeah. on the cup. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was... That was a feature that everybody talked about in cup face years ago when it was first introduced is, okay, so we've moved the weld back away from the edges of the face so we can make this face, I wouldn't necessarily say hotter, I can just say that we could make that hot space or that hot area bigger. Exactly, exactly, and that's, that's essentially what we're doing here is we're making that sweet spot bigger but we're also creating a, a larger sweet spot to where the ball speed's higher as well. Yeah. So let's go back a couple of slides here because mm -hmm. we jumped ahead of ourselves. And so, so we've talked about this, increasing the speed. Talked a little bit about move, the tungsten. Move, put the tungsten the adjustment the bottom. Um, a more compact head. And that's where that L-shaped face is going to come in. I see. Because again, moving that weld line a little lower on the face gives us the ability to thin out that top Moves line. Moves it back. Yeah. When you're talking about Mizuno Pro, anything in it, the guys that are playing these irons, looks matter. Mm -hmm. You know, golf's one of the few things in life I can say I don't like the way that looks and you throw okay. it out. Yeah, yeah. You know, there is such a mental, this is a mental game at the end of the day. I have to have confidence in what I'm looking at. Yeah. So if we can make that top line smaller, it's going to give people more confidence. And if you can move the weld back, you can make the face smaller without compromising the sweet spot. Precisely. Yeah, I get it. Okay. 
Which is what I was just talking about, right? Absolutely. Removing the blasting from the top to further increase the load. If you looked at the old uh, Fly High, that you can see that there's two different colors on the face itself and then the finish on it. That finish on the face used to wrap around the top. Because the weld. Exactly. To yeah. so move the weld back. Yeah, that's... And you know, at the end of the day, black is slimmer. Black is a slimming color. Creating that black top line gives it the illusion it's even smaller as well. Yeah, I get it. So, you know, most of my outfits these days are all blue. <laughs> oh, with, with, especially during the winter, I'm the same way. Um, you know, here's what I'm really excited about, though. We talk about this club and we're all excited. And I know what I'm going to hear the lefties. Why should I be listening to this? We're bringing this to the lefties for the first time. Nice. So for the first time since the fly high has been reintroduced, we are going to have a left-handed model available on this. Yeah. And so you have more left-handed models. I was looking through the, the catalog yesterday. Yeah. You've got more left-handed models throughout the product line than you've had in the past. We have, and you know, we, it's it's a challenge with lefties. You know, that's one of the fastest growing categories in the game of golf. Mm -hmm. um, so, Especially in Canada, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I'm a lefty in everything but sports. But, you know, being the younger son, you get all the hand-me-down stuff. So I was, yeah. ne I was never going to be allowed to be a lefty. We're not buying new gloves and new golf clubs. That you, you're playing right-handed golf. Mm -hmm. But now that there's more exclusivity to, or availability for lefties, you're starting to see more people staying on the left side of the golf of the golf ball instead of switching to the right because there's more accessibility on the right. Yeah. So that you know, as I unpack the fitters for the MP line, I'm looking. What's this? There, every single model has a lefty. Not every model. Um, so this year we're going to bring the two four one and the two four five and lefty. And so we're going to have a hollow body lefty iron for the first time ever. We have never brought a lefty model in. There's no SEL, so I'm not doing a combo set this year. We're bringing the full line of 241, 245 to the lefty this year. Mm -hmm. um, the previous models, the 223, was a lefty only. And you will see in our product cycles now a more consistent lefty offering where you'll get a lefty and maybe two of them in the next cycle. You'll get a lefty and the one that was missed out, and then so on and so forth. So the 24, 2024. Family of MPs. So we've got the two four one, we've got the two four three, and the two four five. Yes. So let's stop. At, start at the top. We'll start at the very top. A okay. pure muscle back. Muscle back. When we're talking about irons, especially muscle backs, that's what Mizuno. When people look at Mizuno, that's what we're known for. Mizuno has gotten more diverse in its iron line over the last couple of years. You know, we we're talking about this off the camera. JPX Hot Metal is the number three iron in all of golf. Mm -hmm. But no matter what we do from that perspective, people are always going to see us as a pretty iron company, as a blade company. Mm -hmm. And this is where we have to make sure that we do it right. And oh boy, did we. You know, when I lived at a country comp in Florida, all of the better players were playing Mizzen. Yeah. Right? That, that's where I developed an appreciation for the MP family. So let's talk about some of the changes that have occurred on the 24 model. Yeah, you know, the lack of technology in the muscle back is the technology. If I came in here and said that we reinvented this muscle back and did this, this, and this, it's no longer a muscle back. Mm -hmm. Muscle backs are supposed to be a traditional, small, more compact iron. And when you talk to anybody playing a muscle back, they will tell you the smaller, the better, the thinner, the better. Mm -hmm. They want that small, compact look. And that's what we focused on. How do we make this club smaller and more compact without losing any of the performance that we get out of Mizuno iron? Mm -hmm. So you can see on the side here with the head length, you notice that it's pretty much the traditional shape and how we have that, that drop off in the scoring irons. Mm -hmm. But if you notice, there's a dramatic shift at once we get to about the five iron where you start seeing that club getting smaller and smaller because that's what that golfer is looking for, something that's a touch smaller. Mm -hmm. Get a little bit more compact without losing that performance they're looking for out of Mizuno. So I can think of, you know, other Japanese companies where, you know, this particular cop was very small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, I don't think I can actually hit that. And that's but, what... But that's, that's where you're going here, is that you've taken this newer model and made it smaller, especially when you, when you get down to the scoring irons. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the goal with anybody. I, I always get asked when I'm fitting, especially the two four ones. I want to see the pitching wedge. Got the pitching wedge with you? Interesting. Because they want to see how small that is. They want that pitching wedge to look like their wedge. Mm -hmm. And if you look over here on the right side, 
Uh, that red line is the 241, or sorry, 221, and then the gray is the 241. And you can see how much smaller it is. Really, that pitching wedge is all red because the 221 overtook it by how much bigger it was. Okay. Same with that 7R. You're seeing how much larger that 221 is by how much is overlapping on that 241. Yeah. So smaller, more compact without losing the feel that you know from a Zeno or the performance that you know from a Zeno. Okay. So, you know, this is an interesting discussion here because I remember years ago we talked about taking this head, head although it looks like a blade, it was actually designed to be more of a cavity bag, mm -hmm. right? And so the weight was pushed out to the edges and so now you've, you've moved away from that. We did. Well, in the muscle back, yes. Um, when you look at this model and this line overall, there's a, there's a club in there for every part of your game. And it's one of the reasons why I continually tell people get fit with, get fit with an open mind because you need to make sure you're able to mix and match and combo. And when you're talking about a Mizuno Pro muscle bag, it's really going to come down to feel. Because those guys who play that iron, they know how to save the center of the club face. Mm -hmm. When you look at their wear pattern, it's about the size of the dime. Mm -hmm. They don't need the perimeter weighting that we were just talking about. Right. You add perimeter weighting to a club to make it more forgiving. Mm -hmm. It adds more stability. takes away from it takes away from miss hits and the ball and the club shifting at impact. Mm -hmm. It gives us the ability to make the club easier to hit. With the muscle back, that's not what we're trying to do. Right. The muscle back is there for feel. You want the mass behind the ball. Does it make it feel softer? Yeah, yeah. precisely. Okay. This is, you know, this is this is an interesting conceptual change for me because, you know, we looked at this years ago and thought, well, you know, we've actually, it looks like a muscle back, but but because of the shape here, the weight was actually pushed out towards the edges. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I don't know. So let's, uh, you know, I'm just going to let you walk through these. Sure. Go ahead. So, yeah, you know, we talked about earlier the head shape, um, size, top lines. We've gotten more narrow. Um, but we also have more of a cambered sole. So you talk about a cambered sole. What that is, it's a touch more round. And what that does is it gives the ability to cut through the turf. A cambered sole used to be called, I um, might be dating myself when I started, the old Bermuda grind. Get mm. that old Bermuda mm -hmm. grind out there where you round out the sole a little bit to get through that Bermuda turf better. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these guys, when they play, they live and practice and train on Florida. Um, a lot of the big tournaments are on the East Coast where a lot of those courses are using Bermuda. So, again, we talked about it. It's earlier. not just Florida. It's, it's all the way up to Virginia. I mean, we got we got Bermuda here in Texas. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a grass we're seeing a lot around the area, and we need to find abilities for us to be able to get that club to the to the ball makes solid impact even though the ball's sitting at the bottom of the grass maybe if it's got swallowed by the rope we got to find a way to get that club to make solid compact yeah. or solid impact which is why i will only fit irons on grains absolutely i won't go out there on a mat to feed get that bounce then yeah. Okay, so tell us a little bit about harmonic impact. And this comes up over and over again. Yeah, this, this is not a new technology from Mizuno. Um, I think as forging has become more mainstream, we have not been the best at telling our forging story and what we can do with the Forge Golf Club. Mm -hmm. We've been forging golf clubs for over 70 years as a company. We've been forging out of the same forging house for that time as well, mm -hmm. out of Chuo Koyo in Japan. So what harmonic impact technology is, is everything from a field perspective that can actually be measured. Mm -hmm. So we have vibration frequency and then we have sound waves. Mm -hmm. What we do is we combine both of those to get the right feel and what the human ear and the human feel can line up with. Mm -hmm. so now that we do that, we have essentially made that club a tuning fork. Okay. And one of the cool things about a Mizuno golf club, if it's a Forge Mizuno golf club, especially if it's one, if it's a two, four, one where it's just solid, you could take the shaft out and strike it. It rings like a tannic fork. There is no other golf club that does that in the world. Only have tried it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really a cool thing. So if you ever if you ever have time at the at a fitting studio, I recommend anyone ask them to take that screw out, take a piece of duct tape, and strike it, and watch mm -hmm. it ring. It's really really cool. Interesting. So that's what harmonic impact test technology is. It's giving us the ability to hone in those sound waves and vibration frequencies to optimize the feel for what the human is looking for. So it's so I'm gonna have to do the same test there that I do with my wine glasses. 
essentially yeah, yeah, yeah essentially no, yeah. yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, cover everybody this is a this is something we've brought in called layers of feel um it, we've kind of tripped into it it wasn't something we realized made a difference mm -hmm. you know we first brought the copper underlay back a long time ago during the tn87 slash mp29 years mm -hmm. and we did it just to keep that chrome plating to stick on the face a bit longer mm -hmm. you know back then we weren't we had a problem at at making chrome plating stick to forged metal and because of that you got more chipping of the mm -hmm. finish mm -hmm. so to do that to get around that we'd add that copper layer to create a buffer to where it would stick to that copper but when we did that only on one model that we do that and it was in japan created the rumor of the Japanese Mizuno iron steel better. And, and I've mentioned to you, this to you before, you know, I have a friend that that buys these heads wherever he can. And so he now has four sets of them and they're all with you know they're, they're all the Japanese version and had the copper underlay on. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny how it started because our tour manager, um, Jeff Cook, is a big believer in the T eighty sevens, was for years. Mm -hmm. So when we went to the drawing board on one of the Mizuno Pro lines, we were talking about what makes certain clubs better. And he interjected about the copper underlay. Mm -hmm. And when we talked to the R&D team about it, when they did their testing, they could not quantifiably show a difference between the two. I mean, you're an engineer, numbers are everything. Mm -hmm. But this is golf we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Feel is completely different. And there are certain things that you cannot measure. Mm -hmm. And when we did a blind test on this club here, with a copper underlay and without a copper underlay, we took about a dozen tour players and then about 25 to 30 non-tour players just to see if they could feel a difference. And it was almost unanimous that they could feel a significant difference between the two. And from then on, we, you've, you've seen that copper underlay not only staying in the Mizuno Pro family, you're starting to see now creep into that tour level of the JPX as well. Right. And and so there was some manufacturing technology that, that copper was not something that, that you could manufacture with and pass EPA tests. Yeah. So that's all been solved now. Oh yeah. The, no more beryllium copper, unfortunately. So you have, those, okay. Those days. Um, um, turf interaction by keeping the same sole camber. Well, increasing the bounce back. So like I said earlier, we did increase that bounce by one degree throughout the entire set. And that was just feedback from the tour players. Mm -hmm. What are they looking for? You know, at the end of the day, when we're building a muscle back, we're going to go to the best of the best because who plays this iron? Generally, it's the better golfer. Mm -hmm. The better golfer at your club, the better golfer that you know, that's probably what they're going to play. So we're going to go talk to them to see what they're wanting. And what they wanted was, was a little bit more balance. Okay, so so explain to the recreational golfers and our audience, camber. Camber. So camber is a way, it's essentially just rounding out this sole, this piece here. If I made this right here, that sole, bottom sole right there really sharp, Mm. It's going to stick. It it's just going to yeah. stick in that club and we're not going to get anywhere. And you're taking half the fairway with you up to the grain. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your grains keeper is going to love seeing the divots that you leave. So adding that rounded sole gives the ability to cut through the turf more efficiently to where, again, we can get that ball, that club to the ball to make solid impact, mm -hmm. especially without digging, without digging. Yeah. So especially catching, when we're in, without catching that meeting, especially when we're in the rough, like okay. exactly. And so yeah, optimize a uh, great graduated tech tapered blade. So if you look at this really closely, the, the blade is smaller here and it progressively gets a touch wider. Mm. It's very, very small. It's not noticeable to the human eye unless you're really staring at it. Or I should pull out my micrometer or something like that. You, 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 I'm sure you've caught it up with all the numbers that you get. But again, it just creates, it just creates a more penetrating ball flight as the loft increases. Uh, a lot of the guys who do play the muscle back, they don't have a problem getting the ball in the air. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get optimal launch windows and getting optimal landing angles and optimal spin. So for them, it's finding the right sweet spot height and CG distance throughout the entire set and making it more consistent. How do we do that? Graduate taper play on the top. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the next one in the line, which is the... 243. 243. The tour speed. Tour speed. What do we call a tour speed? 
you know, there's a lot of golfers out there who maybe have played a Mizuno Pro muscle back in their life. Maybe they were an MP69 guy or an MP29 guy, but things get in the way. Maybe family came first, work comes first, they've gotten older and they've lost a lot of that club head speed. Mm -hmm. So those guys, they don't need perimeter weighting. They don't need forgiveness. They still find the center of the club base, mm -hmm. but they need ball speed. Okay. Because there's a lot of guys out there who don't, they don't want that ball speed that comes from that cavity back because it's maybe too bulky for them. Mm -hmm. or maybe it's just doesn't feel right to them. Mm -hmm. So getting them into something that's going to give them the ball speed they're looking for in that more compact package. So again, we've got thinner top line, more compact. This is significantly more significant than we saw on the 241. 223 was a great model for us. It was very, very successful. Um, I fit a lot of people into it. I'm sure you did as well. But we always listen for feedback. We're always looking to continually improve our product line. And one of the biggest things that we got when it comes to the 223 model was it's kind of long. It's a pretty long club, especially in the scoring hours, that pitching wedge. It just was longer than what those players are looking for, mm -hmm. which to maybe the, the recreational golfer, average golfer, they don't think of that as being a, a downside. But when you're talking about guys who can really hit the ball, mm -hmm. they want it to be smaller, more compact, mm -hmm. especially as we get to the scoring iron. So when you look at this club from the iron all the way down to the gap wedge, significant drop off. So it's not just where it comes out the four or five and the drops yeah, off. The I'm looking at these two and I'm not seeing very much difference there. Am I? You don't really see, especially when you're sitting it down at the, at the ball. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing is how can we get this club to look like a player's iron, but not perform like a player's iron. Mm -hmm. If you look at this image on the right, this again shows you a great example of how much bigger this club is or how much smaller this club has gotten from the two, two, three, the red line is your two, two, three. I mean, if you look all around here at how much more mass and how much more material was all the way around that club, mm -hmm. it was so much longer. So this very faint little club you can see on the inside, that's 243. So the 223 silhouette just swallowed what we've done with 243. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. We haven't lost any performance while going smaller. Okay. Slot. I mean, you've always had a slot. Yeah. You do did it advertising it by putting a plastic fill in it. You know, welded over the top of it. Nobody realized there was a slot in there. And, you know, because you made the bottom smooth, you know, people it didn't fill up with dirt. It does. And people don't, you, you don't want to see those things. We want to make this look as clean as possible and be one of those clothes when you lift up the hood is where you can see the engine that makes this club great. Yeah. And that's what this micro slot is. Mm -hmm. The micro slots are all loft and club specific. Mm -hmm. So when you get into those four and five iron, you're going to notice they're a wider channel. Because when you look at the four and five iron, the goal on those clubs for most people is to get a higher launch, mm -hmm. get more ball speed. How do I get that ball higher? Just like the fly hat we're talking about to get stopping power. Or get that ball to stop on the green. When you get to the six and seven iron, we get more narrow because it's not more really about height. It's about consistency and getting more club head speed or not club head speed, ball speed. Ball speed. And, and ball speed comes from a thinner face. Absolutely. But, you know, but there is a point, I mean, beyond the seven iron where you have so much loft that you're not going to get any spring off the face anyhow. Exactly. And especially when you get to the scoring irons, it's not really about ball speed. Scoring irons are really about consistency. Mm -hmm. When I hit my eight iron, I want it to go this far every single time. Mm -hmm. And my pitching wedge, I want it to go, for me, my pitching wedge is 145. Mm -hmm. I want my pitching wedge to go 145 every single time. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we keep that grain flow forging that we talk about all, all the time, keeping that in the club, give us that consistent feel and consistent performance overall. Okay. Nice. So let's talk a little bit about the goals of this club. Um, the first thing you'll notice is we have a wrap around sole, sole grind. It just can buy, it provides more of a consistent turf interaction. We talk about this already in the 241. Turf interaction is one of the most important things for a golfer, especially at that level who's playing this club. So how do we get more versatile turf interaction? And that's what that wrap around sole grind is gonna do. Yeah, and then another thing that we did is we went and just tinkered with specs a little bit. Just like we did with the Mizuno Pro at adjusting the balance of that club, we tinker with the loft of these just to get more consistency in the gapping. 
again, we talked about the player who plays these irons, they want a club to be this distance, but they also want maybe a seven, eight, nine to have a consistent gapping of, let's say, eight yards. Yeah. They don't want to see an eight yard, eight yard, 12 yard gap. Right. It's keeping that consistency. So, so when you jump from the slot to the non slot, how, there, there's a. You have to let the engineers figure that part out. Exactly. And not have the player think, oh, I just want these a little stronger. Absolutely. Or I want these a little weaker. That you have worked those things out. You know, those guys, those R&D guys have gone to school for a long time and they've done a lot of history, a lot of research on making these things done. And there's something I always like to say, it's called the, the designer's intention. What was the intention of the designer when they built this club? And I try to keep it as consistent as I can to what, they're, what they designed that club to do. And you look at the different models here, we don't have to adjust the loss to get the right launch windows or right landing angles or spin rates. We can just go through the models. And that's one of the things that we did. So now with the two, four, three, we have the consistency through it where it's like, okay, if you're playing this line, you can play it all the way through. But again, we can still tinker and tinker and mix and match, but just trying to make it more consistent throughout the set so someone can play that set forward through four through pitch or four through gap. Okay. So again, we talked harmonics, about Harmonics, yeah, we've talked about this. And I will, you, I could talk about harmonic impact testing tool on Blue in the Bass. It is such a cool technology and seriously something that separates us from everyone else in the world. So I can go ring this one as well? You can't. Okay. And then again, that wraparound soul grind just to give us improved turf interaction. Interaction to get that ball to the center of the impact is so important and just creating ways to make sure that we can get that more consistent. And so, copper, yeah. we've covered this. Oh, yeah. But once again, we've got copper. A copper underlay is going to come out through the entire set. It's going to be something you'll, it is going to be a staple in the Mizuno Pro family for a long time. Yeah. So, as I, if I want to build a mixed set, I'm going to have the same feel. You know, so, precisely. Like the to cut. Precisely. So, let's move on here to the 245. Okay. So, again, I'm not seeing as much of a drop in head length as as we saw in some of the other models. It's not as dramatic as the 243 two, to the 223, but you're still seeing a significant drop off, especially when we're in the mid to long irons. If you look at seven iron here again, 225 is the red, 245 is the gray. You can see it's significantly longer overall. Yeah. So creating that more smaller, more compact look at a dress without losing spin rate and feel and height. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, as, as I look at these two, I'm not seeing too much difference. So this is a pretty easy match if I want to break the center. Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about the technology here. This is a hollow head. It is a hollow body head and there is no foam in there. There's nothing in it. So we talked about harmonic impact testing. Yeah. So, so let's talk about there is no foam in here. So if I'm rebuilding a set of these, I don't have to worry about when I heat up the hosel. What am I going to melt? Correct. Correct. And the reason for that comes strictly back to our harmonic impact testing and our grain flow forge technology. Mm -hmm. Mizuno, we are very intentional with the way we forge in the sense that we make sure that all the grain of the, of the steel stays in the same direction. Mm -hmm. You know, steel is a lot like wood to where if I zoom in and look in on a microscope, there's grain that flow through this like wood. Mm -hmm. So we make sure all that grain lines up when we forge it to where we get that feel to where it rings. So essentially, again, we have that 4135 grain flow forged chromoly. So going back to that material that we use in the hot nettles, but going to a 4135, which is it's more malleable in the sense that we can forge it versus pouring it. Mm -hmm. um, on the back, we got a 431 stainless steel and then a 47 gram tungsten weight in the back. Again, just like the fly high, getting that that CG as low as we can to get that ball flight up. Mm -hmm. 243 is a great club for the guy who wants speed. 245 is a great model for the guy who hits the center of the club face fairly consistently, maybe needs a little bit more wiggle room, but struggles to get the ball in here, or maybe struggles to get more distance. Mm -hmm. That's where this club is going to come into play here. So what I'm seeing here is there's more hollowness than there is here. Correct. You know, when you get to the nine pitching gap, you don't need hollow body construction because we're not looking for speed again mm -hmm. when you get to the scoring iron it's about consistency so yeah when you look at this club here not only are we going away from the hollow body construction we're also going to a new material 
we're going back to what we know best and what people know Mizuno Pro is that 1025 mild carbon steel. Okay. So the 1025E, the elite mild carbon steel, going into that for the more consistency, soft feel. Then we add a 17.4 back piece just to add more mass and back to help get that ball up. Okay. So we've got the weight in the long irons. Correct. And then, you know, so, so what I'm seeing here is that taking this and mixing it to some of the other things, mm -hmm. you know, you could do it if you want to, Absolutely. but really this is designed as a set all the way down to the short irons by your engineers. It is, you know, that, that is always our goal. You know, Mizuno, we are the industry leaders in customization. There's nobody that has more shafts than we do at no upcharge and customization features, but I do. <laughs> you definitely do. Um, from a manufacturer standpoint, we, we are always going to be the industry leaders, but we also do that in our club heads as well. If you want to play the two, four, five all the way through, you can. Mm -hmm. It's great looking at it at, at a dress, whether you're looking at the two iron in it, if you want to make it a longer iron, or if you're going all the way down to the gap wedge in it. So this is a club that you can play all the way down to two iron here. It, that's a change, isn't it? No, we've always had a two iron in it. In we've always had a two, four, five, a two iron. You don't see it. So usually those clubs come four through gap, but two and three irons, a lot of those guys, you know, maybe they don't like how big a fly high is, but want that same technology, maybe in a smaller package, gotcha. they'll go to the two, four, five, two iron. So they like more of a traditional two iron than a direct long iron replacement. I see. Okay. How about a two through eight? It's, there's a little bit of a hollow body in the nine gear, yeah, but it's not as pronounced. You know, that that one's going to be more of a, cons the, the structure itself is going to be one piece all the way through. But again, using that hollow body construction gives us the ability to get more ball speed and get a higher launch angle um, without... And, and maintaining feel at the same time. Exactly, without... Maintaining the, feel the, through the set. Yeah. That's the biggest goal with us. We can, we can make all these... We can make all these technology differences and make this club better, but if it doesn't feel like a Mizuno, mm -hmm. we're going against what we believe in. Mizuno. And if it doesn't feel the same through the set. Correct. Right. Okay. okay. So yeah, the, I, what I, we were talking about earlier, the multi-thickness Cortec face, it's a little bit wider cambered sole. Um, again, got cambered sole, just a rounded sole to help us get through the turf a little more efficiently, but having that Cortec face, so we get more core area over uh, the club face overall. So I'm looking at the grind back here. So, you know, so we've got a little bit, what I might call thicker head, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're maintaining turf interaction, very much like the JPX Pro. Correct. You know, and that's so, so yes, it's, it's thicker, but I've compensated for that by taking the back of it off a little bit. So I don't have the turf interaction. It does, it does two things. One, it, it increases our turf interaction, but I don't know if you've ever looked at our hot metal, hot metal pros as in depth. We are the best in the industry at hiding sole width. Mm -hmm. When you look at our, our club from the sole, you're like, that's pretty big, but when you sit it down, it right. doesn't look that way at all. And a lot of that has to do with the way that we put that sole, design the sole to where it doesn't have that look of bulkiness. Because mm -hmm. nobody, I don't care if you, you shoot 120, or if you shoot a 20 under, mm -hmm. no one wants to see bulk. Yeah. And so, you know, so I'm thinking of the JPX frame as one of the best selling clubs in business, isn't it? Yeah. And that's one of the things that's, you know, people look at Mizuno as we're a pretty iron company. This is our bread and butter, which we have done a great job when it comes to Mizuno Pro for years and years. And we're going to always be the industry leaders when it comes to those, that particular line. But the biggest surprise to a lot of people is that JPX hot metal, hot metal pro is the number three iron in all golf. Mm -hmm. So we really have a golf club for every single golfer. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at right here, some of the lower handicap options and, and this option. But when we have the HL JPX hot metal and the hot metal pro, Mizuno has a club for you throughout the entire line that you're going to get that Mizuno feel and Mizuno performance. So without Hot losing Metal tech Pro versus the 245, how would you describe the difference? Oh, man. I mean, that, that's a night and day difference. Uh, first off, Hot Metal Pro, just from a material standpoint, is different. It's a cast metal. 
Um, so we're able to create more perimeter weighting mm -hmm. um, to degree and a half stronger. So we're going to get more, we're going to get more ball speed on it because it's stronger. And it's also got a thinner face because cast, we can make the cast materials a little bit thinner. Mm -hmm. The best way to know if it's the right one for you is to hit. Okay. I tell everybody, come in with an open mind. Mm -hmm. You never know what the club is going to be for you. Mm -hmm. Copper underlay, we've talked about it. Oh, coppers. So, so you don't, is the copper underlay in the JPX? It is only in the JPX 923 Tour. Okay. As of now. Yeah. Um, we're working on trying to see if it's going to be opportunities for us to bring it into other parts. But right now we're really focusing on using that, that copper in the tour level irons right now. Okay. So here we don't have the, the extreme perimeter weighting Correct. that you would have in the 923 Huntman Pro. Yes, sir. Okay. But we're still getting that same tech, but we're still getting, getting the same technology performance in a different way by using hollow body construction. Yes. Okay. And then again, just going through this, the turf grind, just like throughout this entire set, we were focusing on turf interaction and, um, and aesthetics. How do we make that club look smaller at a dress? without losing the performance of the club. Yes. A little bit thicker top on. It's a touch, but it's not yeah. it's not something to where if you if you mix I it one set. When when you've gone to this head, I don't think that this is going to be as much of a distraction to the guy that's gonna play this head. It's not. And especially when you look at, you know, when when you do mix and match these, so like if you were to take the two four five and the two four three and mix them Chances are you're going to put the two, four, five in the longer in the longer irons. Exactly. So you're yeah. going to you don't want to look down at a, a, a butter knife when you're hitting a four iron. Right. This, yeah. Then we just get to a whole mental game of can I hit this club? Yeah. So you know, for us to be able to mix and match these sets without losing confidence and losing feel and consistency is something we're very proud of. So I could go all the way down to a two iron here. Yeah. As opposed to a fly high, it's just. Which would you rather be looking? Which one's the best for you? Yeah. Mix it a match and a combo. I didn't go to the, do we have one more slide or is this going to perfect? This is it. Yeah. This is actually what I wanted us to go to because it just really sums up what we're doing. And I, I want to finish this off with a story. I was fitting the other day a junior and he's top 15 in the country. Very great ball striker. It's amazing what these kids can do with this nowadays. How old was he? He was 13. Yes. It was unbelievable. Yes. I mean, he's played championship major level golf courses and shot under par at some host of major championships. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, kid's unbelievable. He went in with the idea he wanted 241. Mm -hmm. He was dead set on it because he wanted to play in muscle back. It was his first mission of set. So, he yeah. did all the research. He was like, I want to play the blade. But as we got into testing, he realized that 243 was the club for him. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go 241 in the, in the scoring irons and 243 in the long irons. And we essentially shifted him to two four three two four five, and it wasn't because he couldn't hit the two four one. It was because he liked the confidence the two four three gave him and that little bit more ball speed that he got. He's thirteen. He's not fully grown yet, yeah. so he's not this. He's not going to be able physically or mental. Not yet. I mean, you know, they they come in and they want something they've read about. Correct. And what they really need to do is come in with an open mind and experience the clubs. I don't care if you're thirteen or if you're eighty three. Yeah. You need to come in and see us with an open mind. I, you, you probably could say this better than anybody as well. There's very rare that I, I fit somebody to exactly what they were looking for in the sense of this, the shaft I want, this, the head I want. Because if we, if we come in with an open mind and actually do some testing, it's, it's limitless what we can do, especially with the technology Mizuno has in custom fitting, the shaft options, the head options that we have. Mm -hmm. We have so many opportunities here to where we can make the set built for you not you building your swing to a set. So your 13 year old went from thinking he was going to play the 241 to a combination of 245s and 240. It was the funniest thing because I put the seven iron down for him because we were just tinkering and he didn't like the distance, which he's again, when he's 13, he likes distance. Mm -hmm. He sat it down. He goes, this looks good. Let's hit it. Let's see what happens. First swing immediately. I like this. And I knew right then, let's see what we can go from there. And everything kind of, the door completely open. It's truly amazing with the talented players, you know, one or two swings. They know. They know. They know immediately. It's, I wish I could do that. 
it, would, it takes me like a hundred swings to figure out if I like something. But I mean, these guys that they're so dialed in, they, again, there's their impacts aside with time. Right. So they know immediately what they're looking for, what they're trying to feel. And if you come in with an open mind, you don't know what we're going to put you in, but we have the tools here to put you in the set. That's going to get you the best rounds that you can play. I tell, I tell people constantly, do you want to have a set that looks good in the bag that you want? Or do you want to have a set that's going to take money out of your buddy's pockets on Sundays? All right. So at the end of the day, I want you scoring lower. Yeah. Where the back's going to look great. I'm just going to regardless. Yeah. But let's put you into clubs that are going to make you better. All right. You know, as I'm sitting, I always say to people when I pick up an iron, what's your objective here? May look at me. Okay, what answer are you looking for? And, I, and, and my answer is always the same. When I got this club in my hand, I want a short putt. Exactly. That's my job. I want to, I want to, we're not playing darts, we're playing, cro we're, we're not playing croquet, we're playing darts. I want that ball as close as I can get to the green as possible and as consistently as possible. Not close to the green. Close, sorry, <laughs> close to the pen. Close to the pen. See, you're, we're talking about my game, I just want to be close to the green. <laughs> it's, yeah. Okay, so Rich, once again, you know, thanks for coming in. Russ, it's, awesome. it's always pleasure. a pleasure to talk to you, learn a little bit more about about the clubs that I'm working with and, and get the perspective that you have having spent time with the engineers at Atlanta. I appreciate it, Russ. If there's anything you guys need, let me know. I'm Tiff. New sneakers. I, I, I know a guy. I know a guy. Thanks, Ruth. Hey, Russ, thank you, man.